Um, when I was teaching, the one thing I hated doing was teaching towards exams. It's a nightmare because you don't feel as if you're giving students yeah. a good shot at understanding what their area is like. And this is partly why the idea from this workshop came to be because there will be maps that you can learn things about your area. You will be able to see the industrialisation along the river, the place that the used burn actually played in it. So it isn't purely for regeneration, it's also a, a sort of wider view of what your area is like. And it's important, for example, that you know to stay this. It's important that you know to where he is, uh, because it's part of your history, it's part of what you did. Um, or what you would have done if you'd been working here. I've got half an hour, so it's going to be quick. I've put a shed load of stuff on this PowerPoint so that you don't have to go ferreting around, looking for bits and pieces that you might want to maybe include in something. There's lots of pictures, there's lots of photographs, and you will notice that when you go through it, it's with thanks for, or with thanks to, or with permission from. Some of these maps are actually Godfrey maps and they're a bit tight on copyright, so you just, you know, err on the side of caution and be very careful. Asking the right questions will dictate whether or not you get the right answer. And partly this came from a question by, by Keynes that was said today, and he said, one of the students said, didn't they, about how successful or how can you judge whether or not a regeneration scheme is going to be a success. And that's going to be one of the things that hopefully Dale will just mention in his, in his talk after me, assuming you've all lived through it. So, four questions. How and why do places vary? Well, we've got the Usburn, we know where it is, hopefully you'll, you'll have been there. Um, you'll be able to walk through it, it's very safe, it's easy to get to. Also, it's important that we know what actually happened there. If you want to understand regeneration, you need to go back a bit. Why might regeneration be needed? There's some really nice photographs. A match in a bomb, you know, comes to mind. It was very, very run down. And that would be, explain why you had to do something to it. How is it managed? There's this thing about stakeholders. And then how successful can you see that regeneration is going to be? We know that the used burn developed over time. We know it started off and it was extremely early with its development. It wasn't linked to Newcastle at all. It was just on its own. Tidal river, narrow little valley, lots of resources, labour came in, and as a result, it became industrialised. And here's an early photograph, an aerial photograph, of the used burn valley. And you can see there are bridges, you can see there are developments on either side. See other bridges there, bank bridge, and then you've got the big ones at the top. Curve. But one of the things that you need to look at is the physical makeup of the valley. That determines what went where. On this side, it's much steeper. So you couldn't get the big factories, the big units, the big ironworks. The big areas of development there, it's much narrower along here, and yet you've got that bit there at the top end. But this bit, it was a structure of the valley which determined what happened. You've got all sorts of different kinds of industries there. A lot of them were very much based on raw materials. That is awful. You will be able to see it, and you will be able to see it on the Usburn Trust's website. It shows that most of your industries are on the east on the west east side with some on the west and of course you've got two very large lead works which polluted the area so you can't see it don't expect to you'll be able to see it on the website that's mine that's on the Usburn website as well showing where the industries were if that was your particular interest but there are also a lot of in industrial maps which show you where it was. And it's dated, and I just stuck these on because it shows where the development started. And it developed over time, miles away from Newcastle, not a lot there, growing over time to 1895, a peak. And it was all down to industrial linkage. See, this would adapt into and relate to what you do with industrialisation. 
industries were linked. Materials came up the river possibly as ballast. It could be sand, it could be flint, the sand could be used to make glass, it could be used, the flint could be used to grind into clay to make pottery. You're looking at probably at bricks as well. So we're looking at raw materials being heavier, it was all down to transport cost. Within the valley, I put these on so that you could have an idea about the different kinds of industries which were there. You can link that to South Wales as well. This is a, this is a sort of mirror of South Wales. Narrow valleys, heavy raw materials. This is 1895-1900. All of this was building up over time. And one of the problems is it was old. And one of the problems is the housing was deteriorating. There was no room for expansion. Your industries were always going to be confined. So when the rest of the world changed, and the rest of the river changed, you had this little historical capsule, and they could do nothing about it. So linkages, transport costs, determined what you could make. Material could come up the river, as it was tidal, products can go out. So industry developed near to the river. People came into this area, and you can tell where they came from, because there are two lots of census data on the Usburn website. We know that a lot of people came in, it tells you where they came from. It could be Northumberland, it could be Blythe, it could be Ireland, and they came in to do work. So the census data tells you all about the people who came here and what they actually did. If you look at 1881, 1891, very different to 1911, because by 1911, all of the industries were changing. So, remember, roads were narrow. They were built for horse and carts. Everything was built up to the roads. No room for expansion. Links, housing was pretty grim. By 1850, the whole area was quite old. You've got lots of photographs coming up. And there are photographs of the quayside and the river. And this idea of a wherry was very important because it was a ship with a flat bottom and you could pole it up. You couldn't use sails because all of the bridges were too sh short, they were too low. So it had to be manpower. So if you have the tide behind you, and I'm running through this very quickly because it's just background, till we get up to the good stuff, which is the mouth of the Usburn. You can tell it's old for the obvious reason you've got um, a masted ship at the back, and you've got wherries at the bottom ready to be pulled up to get to the factories to take coal up or to bring things out. You've also got to remember that a lot of Newcastle was popped by coal mines. There's one in Elsie when we look at Walls End and Wellington Quay. Coal mines all over the place. Subsidence is, is a, was a real problem. So we've got these pictures which tell you what the mouth of the used berm was like. This is the quayside. Obviously, it's, it's, it's really flash, but it's deteriorating even now when it was taken. And the traffic which came into the time went all over the place, whether it was Aberdeen, whether it was Norway, whether it was any of the Baltic ports, whether it was London, and they all had their own wharfs. So it's all to do with shipping. But that was going to change. You've got large areas, the CWS, that one is listed. Can't do anything with it. Nice building. All of these, I just about remember those, they had to be demolished because shipping traffic was starting <coughs> to decline and also it was very old. Hamburg. The dead house. Now, this is the dead house near the used burn and it says grappling irons. Why? I used to hate it when people used to ask me, you don't put your hands up and just pick on somebody, you could pick on a member of staff. Right, why were the grappling irons? Why were the advertisers? Pick on your, pick on your seat, that'll be. Right, come on, why grappling irons? I can't remember. John? John might know. 
Well, they were hooking dead bodies out they of the were river. For hooking dead bodies out of the oh, river, hence well. the idea of grappling irons. The biggest mistake they ever did was to put actually, if you, if you found a corpse floating in the river, you got a pence or a shilling if you hauled it out. So there was a very vibrant trade on a Saturday night when people were staggering along. You just nudge them and they'd go in the river and then you were you just pull them out I and mean, it's like having a full-time job but you can see it's it's tatty you know it's tatty and it's run down the dead house is where your dead people went because if you were in the river for any length of time you become pretty dismissed i'm not going to details barrels ships housing now housing was not exactly very nice you could have a whole family of about eight living in one room. You were posh if you could actually afford to rent two. Two rooms and everybody would live in it. No running water, remember. Horrible toilets, ash pans, no running water. People drank beer. Children drank, drank half beer because the water being boiled. We're looking at average age of about 40. You'd be, you'd be, you'd be finished by then. If you work in the lead works, you could be finished by the age of 12 because of the lead dust which got into your body. It wasn't a very nice area. One, we were out once and this, this voice piped up, that's my auntie there. So it's still within living memory. This is 1935, it's not 1835, it's 1935. And you've got brown jug yard, that's 1936, 1935. Pretty horrible, but you can see the river, still important, and it was tidal, you can tell, because you've got all the mud banks at the bottom. Little Hensel, cattle sanatorium, you had animals coming in, being slaughtered, going to the area where you would have the leather works. Again, transport costs, walked along the quayside, into there, are you healthy? Smashing, go along there and you would, the meat and the skins would come off then it would be used within the area. Don't get the impression the river was really narrow because it wasn't. This is the width of the river and these are the houses and the fact it looks dusty is a, a reflection on the quality of the air. It would be pretty horrible and you've got all of these little boats waiting. Look at what they're carrying. It's nothing to do with skills which came later on. It's different skills. Little Hensel, one of the first places to make window glass. People lived in courts. Map resources. Now, one of the problems was that with the railways, you had the railway going across the valley, it bypassed the river, it went along the cross, and therefore you had an east-west axis. It bypassed the river, bypassed the Eusburn, that was the beginning of the end. You'll come across a word which is a stave. Stave was like a drop, you just had a big thick tub and you tipped it into a boat. These were the staves, this is the extent of the development along the river. We'll look at a photograph of this. All of these were to do with the railways, to bring coal and to bring them into the boats and export. So coal was a major player in this area. When you go into your rooms for your maps, I want you to look at this because you'll see where the areas where they actually built ships were, the size of the ships, at the time they were huge, later on you could do nothing, you couldn't make bigger ships. Other people like Sweden, South Korea, areas like Japan were taking over, so we were losing markets. We still had things at Swan Hunters, we still had things in Wall's End, but they were having to change. And here he stays. It was a huge, all the coal came down there and was tipped. So it was a huge undertaking. The boats are very small. And there's the, the world unicorn, quite an iconic picture of a ship being built at the bottom of some street. You came out and you would see it there, looming over everything. So why, having said that it was quite, ex, you know, quite exciting and it made a lot of money and it had industries, why was it going wrong? Well, but 
cyclic decline. Cyclic decline meant that it was no longer fit for purpose, no expansion, limited skills. There was the war, depression, Wall Street crash, depression in the 30s, slum clearance, and financial constraints, which meant that we weren't able to invest. End of the Second War, urban myth. Three more days, we'd run out of money. If the Germans hadn't capitulated, we, would, we wouldn't have known what to do. We'd run out of a lot of resources, we'd run out of money, and we were at the very, very end of what we could cope with. And was that an urban myth, or could that be true? Who knows? But at the second, in the Second World War, if that was our situation in Britain, talk to me about Brexit, if that was the situation in Britain, how on earth could we regenerate anywhere if we hadn't got any money in the bank? Think about that one. So, uh, so I'll put that down there, models. Now, what kind of resources have you got to look at? Right, health and safety, eat your heart out. You've got two little children playing in a tin bath in a disgusting, filthy area, which is part of the Ouseburn, it's the river in the Ouseburn, probably playing pirates, but this is what the Ouseburn was possibly like in some areas before you went into the culvert, and yet the kids are down there playing, just playing and having a great time. Housing wasn't terribly good, it was underneath the bridge there, but this is what the Ouseburn is looking at. Right. If you're talking about regeneration, it's all crushed together. These areas were falling apart. It was all around here. You had seven stories. At the time, it was a Dobson building, one of those, but now it's horrible. And you can see how it's all being demolished. You have buildings which are empty. You have smokestack industries. Do you know what smokestack industries are? It's where you were burning coal in order to give you power. Smokestack industries. Air quality would have been horrendous. Empty buildings. Beautifully designed dallas carpets. Fits in a treat. Areas where you've got the mouth of the used burn. Old buildings. Very dour. Malmore key. Buildings. You've got the remnants of the quayside. Would you invest in an area like this? Of course you wouldn't. It's awful. Hasn't got the infrastructure. Hasn't got the building. Probably hasn't got the, the labour force to go with it. Houses have gone. People have gone. Where have they gone? Somewhere else. Not here. Because if you look at the photographs, it's struggling through <coughs> neglect and through lack of investment. It's almost like deindustrialization. Black and white, of course, suggests that it's, it's much worse than it could be. But this is the bit down here where you've now got the mailings, corrugated iron for your buildings. That's a bit dark. But you can see people built straight up to the river, so you couldn't expand it if you really wanted to. Or I've just put all of these on so it'll give you an idea of what it was like. Seven storeys, the edge, areas where you had the boat club, pretty grim. People like going out in boats. You had pigeon crease, boat club. These came from the boat club. You get a general sense of what it was like. I think despair would come in one word, but also it wasn't very attractive, if you like, to have any investment. And there was very little money coming out. So as I say, one, once you come into this, it's a lot of wider river, and that's what it ended up. So why do you need regeneration? Draw your own conclusions. Geography is a subject of the obvious. That's why it's so hard. So you could look at that and I could ask you the question, why does it need regeneration? Is it obvious? You're going to say something that just proves you haven't started sleeping with your eyes open. 
Is it obvious what you need with regeneration here? This is the legacy of you in the Usburn now, where you have got buildings, partly demolished areas, horrible atmosphere, and you're going to knock it all down, hopefully. So why did you need regeneration? People need jobs. You need a better environment, you need the river sorting out, you need to attract people in, better air quality. And you have to decide, well, what kind of data would you like to collect in order to answer one of the questions that we've been looking at? Is there any media? Do you want to actually achieve first-hand knowledge, which is primary data collection, or do you want to go off secondary collection? Do you want to go out and go to the same place and take a photograph now and then use a photograph of what it was like to begin with and see how it's changed, see how regeneration's changed it. How is it managed? And this is where Dale's going to come in in a couple of minutes. Do you rely on the government? It took till 1970 to get money in the bank and to realise that there were large areas which needed help. You need to know what a stakeholder is, Tiny Way Development Corporation, community. Communities are taking more part now than ever before in regeneration and making decisions. People are entitled to go out and give their opinion. And a lot of the time they do, and it's very, very pertinent as to what you're going to do. How successful has the regeneration, I'm whizzing through this, you can tell, can't you? How successful has it been? What kind of things do you actually judge success on? How many people go to the use burn? What does the use burn offer? Dale will talk about this in a minute. What kind of criteria can you choose? And therefore, does it give you an opportunity to go out and get some primary data? Or does it give you an opportunity to go out and look at other kinds of media? Rebranding, Oosburn Futures, the Oosburn Trust, which is where all this data will be stored. Live, learn, play, work. Four mantras for regeneration. Living in the Oosburn, I love the picture of this one, this is one of the Carilia Niggly ones. It was going to be Steenberg's yard with this huge area at the side, like the Starship Enterprise, ready to take off being far too big, unable to really put it in the air, in there because there, there would be cars and parking, etc. But it's been washed to go into something different. We now have the mailings on one side, mailing after Thomas Mary the Potter, and you had boxes of, of development and different kinds of housing. Not social housing, it is incredibly expensive. People buy in. When they were marketing it, Carillion uh, were very clever. They sent out welcome baskets to all the flats. And in that basket, you've got all sorts of different freebies. You know, a five pound voucher here, some who's burnt coffee somewhere else, um, the booklet's information. From that kind of area, you can walk into town, not a problem. And this is one of the things that was important, but also buying into the the idea of living in a cultural, quirky community, and it's what people wanted. Apparently now there's going to be an ice cream parlour. Ice cream and pizza. Ice cream and pizza. Now, what does that tell you about who lives there? Not a bank, not a bread shop, or where you can buy milk. Ice cream and pizza. And those, those premises have been vacant for a long time. There's no shop. Go to Morrison's or along the quayside. So we're not looking. This is where they came out at first. We're not looking at cheap. We're looking at oh, I don't know, two hundred and nine thousand for a a two bedroom. So it's not social housing. And Steenbergs won't be social housing either. Not approved. Marmor Key. It makes me chuckle because you've got. This area here with a huge sewage problem in the middle, because it's got uh, sewage pipes and treatment and whatever you have, but the Malmore Key game is going to be developed on the edge. We live in an area where it's gale force winds and it rains a lot 
and we're encouraging people to go and stand on an unprotected little stick as the wind rustles down and you get dogs and people's hats flying past. I wonder sometimes who they get to do these pictures. But the idea is it's going to make it nice and it's going to be a mixed land use. Then, of course, you could have a 20-storey flat. 32. Flats. 32, was it? Yes, 32. <laughs> really fitted in. But you do have other areas where you've got nice, safe areas where people can live, and that's farm view. It's at the other end of the valley, near to where you've got the bridges. So you could live there. You could also play there. Education takes a big thing. You can go riding, you can go to the farm, look at the animals, go down the Victoria Tunnel. Alternative forms of employment and entertainment. No longer are you having heavy industrial development where you have transport costs. You're looking at skills, pubs, music, entertainments. Areas where you've got very large artists, seven stories. Usburn Festival, different kind of activities, bike, Christmas, uh, you've got local artists, a heritage home day. You can work there, look at all these things. I'm sure this is possibly out of out of date, but you do have an industrial estate. You have all the people who work in the pubs and who work in creating food. You've got artisan bakers, you've got a coffee works, you've got Oosburn Coffee, you've got an area where you have a small independent <coughs> microbrewery. All of these things are aimed at a certain level in society where you've got the money and you go out to have a nice time and you get the ambience of the valley. Not the fact you opened your mouth in, in 1890 and couldn't breathe for the pollution. Totally different. Right the other way. Small, secure, you need to have skills and of course you have the toffee factory. <coughs> now, the toffee factory is interesting because it creates different kinds of jobs. Very high quality, very high tech, very industrial people, very high educational people there. Very few people would be using shovel. Very few people would be making glass. Except, of course, people who do it in different <laughs> studios. Dale makes glass, that's right. <laughs> Printing, artistry, and bang, that's it. So, think about it. I mean, even within time, and you're still alive, which is always a plus. <laughs> if you need anything, uh, get in touch with me via station. the Eastbourne Trust. Miss Collins, you'll be able to get in touch with me. Bye, Joe. Dale, you're up. <laughs>